Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host and I'd like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. Maybe you choose to watch on YouTube, my YouTube channel, the same as all my other social media, The Real Lisa Ann, and every Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, we do a live premiere where we are in the chat kind of breaking down some backstories, the podcast, catching up with my community. And I will say, last Friday night's chat, the gravy train has left the station episode was fantastic. A lot of good, really good interactions of hearing how everyone kind of perceived that situation and how everyone received the information that I gave on explaining that situation. I think the most important thing, the takeaway that I wanted everybody to truly have is that we do not have to walk away from every situation in our life angry. We don't have to carry a grudge. We don't have to be mad at people. We don't have to be disappointed. When you choose to make a situation better for you, you should be happy because you listen to your internal compass, your gut feeling, your instinct, and you made a move that was better for you. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a slight on the other party involved. Breakups happen, friendships end, business relationships transition and end. That's life. And every person that we're involved with, every step along the way on our journey mattered. Even if it ended poorly, even if it didn't serve you or satisfy you, they mattered. We all matter in each other's lives. And so me explaining myself on last week's episode was so important because I wanted everybody to know I don't harbor ill feelings. I don't feel the need to get people in a group together and and incite some sort of cancel culture situation. No, I'm explaining my take. And maybe when you go through a situation and you feel so incredibly slighted, you can take a step back and say to yourself, maybe it's that I wasn't slighted. Maybe it's that I see such a great value in myself that I knew that there was more somewhere else for me. Whether it's the grass is the only greener expression whether it's the grass is always greener situation, whatever you think it is, think about how strong you are to make a situation that benefits you. Don't blame it on the other person. Take the ownership of, I see something better, or I feel more comfortable with this. In my situation that I shared with everyone on last week's episode of my podcast, I explained how I was feeling uncomfortable and I knew that there was an alternative situation that would make me feel more comfortable. That's all. No blame on anybody else. Just me kind of taking back the power of saying like, I feel a little uncomfortable with what's about to unfold. And if I'm even thinking that what's going to make me more comfortable? Well, absolutely. Sitting at my friend's house on a Saturday night with his two amazing dogs, stuffing my face with pizza and watching NFL was better. So I appreciate everyone that was in the chat. It was the biggest room we've had so far. I appreciate all of the feedback that I got from the episode. And I hope that you could take my lead and you can tell yourself in situations that you feel are not going the way you hoped they would go, that maybe it's just you being smarter than the situation and saying to yourself, I think there's something better. I think there's a better option here. Let me explore that option that suits me and not blame the other person for not giving me exactly what I had hoped for. Now, I mentioned NFL, and this weekend was Wild Card Weekend, and it couldn't be a better name because it was wild. The games were amazing, and it's this time of the year where I get to really enjoy the games. Fridays, I'm finished with my fantasy football Fridays, which I do through the whole fantasy football season up until the holidays. And then it kind of, that's when, you know, our seasons are done. And then I get to really just enjoy the games and talk with my friends about the games. I have my Fridays back, so I have a little bit more free time so I can get my stuff done. And then when I'm watching the games, I'm not like doing laundry and trying to do all of these other things that I really, really, really get to enjoy them. And that is exactly what I did this weekend. Although I did sneak out on Sunday. 
uh, for a friend's baby shower in the city. And I'm so excited to have my first girlfriend in the city having a baby and I can get on babysitter duty. I can be, uh, we could be walking partners. Like I have all these big plans because you know, babies in the stroller with the walks and you always see a group of friends around the moms and that's going to be us. So what was funny was it's a sports community. So I know her through the sports world and almost every single table. We were in this beautiful private uh, front atrium of this restaurant, had beautiful flowers and greenery everywhere and flowers on the table and baby photos of her and baby photos of her man. And every table had a phone on the table watching the Bills game. Every single table was like, we want to be at the shower. I mean, this is all women. Okay. A couple guys there, but mainly women. we want to be at the shower but we got to be watching this game. So at halftime, everyone got up and was like socializing. Then I, I saw the first person back at the table with their phone. I'm like, oh, halftime must be over. So it was really funny. We enjoyed the shower. It was a great, great time to get out. And I will say, Annie brought me, she drove me, she picked me up in the city and went together and we left right after the first game. So I was able to come home and enjoy the next two games. There is one more game that is going to be the Dallas Tampa Bay game, which I am very nervous about, but what haves you, this is just, it is what it is. I've enjoyed the season and this is the time of the year where we really get to get excited about who do we think is going to go all the way to the Super Bowl which very much so could be Brock Purdy led San Francisco 49ers. If you want to hear more of my sports takes, which I try not to bore everyone here with, because I know not everybody is as into it as I am. You could hear me every Wednesday night on better sports live. I am live on the app from seven to 10 PM. Eastern time. You can follow on social media at better network. You can watch some of the clips on YouTube, but that's where I really get into it. Me and my co-host Rick Kamla, we talk everything. We talk NBA, we talk NFL pretty soon. I'm going to bring Allie McCann on to talk some golf. Steph Smalls and I are going to collab a bit more. So that's where you get it. But NFL is great. One thing I do really enjoy doing during the late game though, every Sunday night is when I pack up my orders from my bookstore, shoplisaann.com. I pack them up while I'm watching the Sunday night game. So Sunday nights, I'm kind of in my office for the late game. And I tinker around with like, you know, what are my targets for this week? What are the goals? What things do I have to accomplish? I fill my book orders because then I can take them to the post office first thing Monday morning. Post office is closed Sunday, so I don't worry about the Saturday orders till Sunday night. And it's just become this like routine. It's like two or three orders come in. It's just enough for me to tinker around and get them set up and then have them by my door so I can take them to the post office. And it's one of those things. And Kay and I have had this conversation. When you write a book and you're selling a book through a store, it is the least profitable thing you're going to do for a living, right? By the time you put in your time, you're all of the things that you're doing and you're not, you know, it's just to tell you it's the least profitable, but it is the most joy. It is the most joy. And Kay and I both agree sending books out, knowing that somebody believes in you enough to order from your store. They trust that you're going to send them. You sign them. There's just something so special about that situation. And it soothes me and gets me ready for my Monday. So Sunday night during the late game, I'm always packing up book orders, which is super, super fun. I have had a great kind of new, new little thing in my wheelhouse here, ticket rep. Ticket Rev Jason Shatsky was on last month. We talked all about, he came up with this new innovation in buying and selling tickets. Well, I'm finally on the, yay, this is so exciting. We're starting to do ticket giveaways. When this podcast comes out, you will be the same day as me choosing the first two winners. And it's really a simple way to enter. It's just following at Ticket Rev on TikTok on Instagram, whatever you're on. If you're on both, both great. And I put up a video about the ticket giveaway. They're giving away two tickets to the divisional round of NFL games. Game of the winner's choice, which I thought was really cool because it doesn't limit people where like they have to buy flights last minute. They have to do this. So they're going to pick the game that's closest to them or easiest for them to get to. And it comes out of comments. So we're going to go through all of the comments that everyone left. I'm hoping people leave comments. I saw a really great one the other day. Um, it was a, it was a girl said she wanted to take her brother. He'd never been to an NFL game before, you know, those types of comments and tagging ticket rev. So we just get to choose through those. 
And then I'll be doing a live with Jason uh, at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, and we're going to pick our winner. And I'm like, oh, if I get to do this regularly and just make it rain with tickets from Ticket Rev, I'm going to be super stoked. I've got a lot of cool things going on, but one of the things that I'm secretly doing right now, and I'm halfway through the month, and I've succeeded. So I put myself on a spending freeze. If you read my second book, The Life Back, this was something I did when I dove into my life of minimalism. And the reason I planned it for the beginning of the year is we all get a little bit lax, you know, around the holidays. We're buying gifts and then you see things for yourself. You cannot be in a store and not see stuff for yourself. And, you know, you're buying things. And also I had laid out all of my events for the year and I was like, okay, I'll be savvy but the week between Christmas and New Year's when things are on sale. I'll do all my dress shopping. Of course, like another pair of shoes might come up down the road, right? But like I'll do all of my main wardrobe shopping for the next 12 months and be organized on what I have. And then come January 1st, I'm going to go through everything I have when it comes to additional expenses, as well as organize the wardrobe and put myself on a complete spending freeze. After having Jeremy Schneider on, the personal finance guy, I was like, there's got to be one or two more tweaks that I can do. I knew that I was meeting my financial planner last week. So I was like, okay, I got to have my ducks in a row because we always have a very serious conversation. You know, what are you doing different this year than last year? You know, what are you, where are you going to invest? How do you want to diversify? So like, all of these things kind of came into at one time where I was like, all right, I've got all my outfits. There's nothing else I will need. So let's do a 30, 60, 90 day challenge. Let's see how far you can get in this thing. We're going to start with 30. So I'm halfway through the 30. I have not bought one thing that wasn't a necessity. Necessity being, you know, food, um, you know, just completely set. No, no clothes, no trinkets, nothing that wasn't for my business. Um, so, you know, you have to really reel it in. And for me, these websites, they know me. Saks Fifth Avenue, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus. They send you emails. They send you text messages. They know what you recently looked at and they send you an email when it's on sale. And that's always the slippery slope for me. Well, it's like, well, I was already looking at that. Well, thank you. You know what I mean? I mean, the mindset, the way they get into your head. And I've been so good this whole month. As the messages come in, I just hit delete. I don't even look at them. So the other day, Nordstrom sends me a $60 gift card. So it's like my bonus points uh, for the year or whatever. So like I get this $60 gift card. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, I have free money to spend. If I only spend $60, I get to get something new while I'm on a spending freeze. What do I need? So I was like, okay, really? I go through sneakers. Um, been running a bit. Uh, I've been working out a lot. So like, okay, get, just get something practical. See if you could find a pair of sneakers. I found a pair of sneakers for exactly $60 that were perfect for working out. And I was like, hmm, just satisfied my entire urge to shop. They will be here and I will open them and cherish them because I have nothing else new coming into my life. But I find these freezes are fun because I get more creative. I appreciate the things that I already have. Example, I realized that like, you know, I have a couple art pieces that I moved to this apartment when I moved here almost three years ago from my old apartment that I never hung up. And I have this blank space in my bedroom wall. And I was doing a selfie the other day and I was like, that wall is so white. And I went under my bed and there was the canvas art. And I was like, you know what? It's pretty dusty. You should probably clean this off. Why don't you hang this up? It'll give you like a new, new feeling. You're not spending any money. This is something you already had. And ironically, I had thought I lost a pair of earbuds. And when I went under the bed to get the canvas, the earbuds were there. So it was like a total win. And by the way, I always have two pair of uh, earbuds. And the reason I have two is because sometimes I'm on a long trip and they'll die. And so instead of having to be without them, I always have two. You know, so I'm listening to sports radio eight hours a day. I have earbuds in so I can walk all around my apartment doing a bunch of things. And when that, when I thought I lost that pair, which was like the week before New Year's, I was like, you cannot buy another pair right now. Just wait. You normally don't lose things. They might come back into your life. Just be patient. Normally I would just, it was, no, it was after New Year's because I was already on my spending freeze. And I'm like, these are not a necessity. You cannot buy these right away. And I don't normally lose things. So I was like, 
they are going to come back into your life. I know it. And that day I had been thinking about them. And when I went to get out the canvas, there they were. They had slid under my bed. So I not only had to come up from the earbuds that I found, but I took that piece of art out from under my bed. I wiped it all down, had some dust. You know, I hung it up. I used the level. I did everything nice. It looks so good. It gives my bedroom so much happiness. It's got, it's really colorful. I've woken up next to it now four days and I'm like, oh, this just looks so good. I can't believe I didn't do this before. When you're not always buying new things, you become more creative. You tap into creativity you didn't know you had because you're having to really think about things, right? It's not that easy, instant gratification of getting something new, going on to Amazon and ordering something. And so I've got the new, new of the artwork that I already had, uh, that cost me nothing, but it does really make you think. I then went through all of my streaming services and I did this the first week in January. And I was like, okay, like you have to get rid of something, you know, even though 1599 doesn't seem like much a month, after 10 months, after 12 months, after five years, these things do add up. And I don't watch other than sports, a ton of TV. And when I do between, you know, Netflix, YouTube TV, um, Amazon prime, like I'm satisfied. And I realized I wasn't using Hulu much. So I was like, you know what? Just cancel Hulu. It's one less streaming service. If you totally miss it, you can go back to it. But what was the last thing you watched on it? And you can go through your like recent, what you've watched. I'm like, I'm really, since Younger Ended was a show, Darren Star, that I loved. Um, I haven't really watched anything on YouTube. So not only am I not spending additional money on things that I don't need that aren't necessities, I'm also being creative with money that I'm already spent or already spending and reeling it back again. I think it's just like a fun thing to do. It's a personal challenge. Um, I'm halfway through my first 30 day. I told myself this would go on a 30, 60, 90, see how I felt at 30. And if I could go further, it just feels fun to be a little frugal. And also I have everything I need and it can just be, especially in New York city, everywhere you go, there's shops. Everybody is dressed to the nines. You see style in real life. You're not in a car. You're walking around. You're like, Oh, that coat. You know what I mean? Like, oh, maybe I should go to Zara. It's like, no, you do not need another coat. You can barely stuff the coats that you have in your coat closet. So this has been a little personal thing that I've been doing. It's been a ton of fun and it helps me be creative. The most important thing is having more time to spend with friends. And when we're spending less, we need to work less. We have more free time. We can be present in the moment. When I was in Vegas for AVN, I arranged a lovely dinner with a bunch of friends, some of which I knew didn't know each other. And I thought it'd be a great time for them to meet up. And one of them was today's guest. So my friend that's here today, you've heard before on a podcast, but now with a new topic, Romy Chase is it back in the music game. She did it when she was younger and now she's pursuing music as a little side thing for her to grow herself. Amazing woman. She was one of the women that I had at this beautiful dinner that you could see here in this photo. We went to Fuhu at Resorts World. The room they gave us was spectacular. The food was amazing. And it was so cool to see, you know, a lot of the women that I know maybe don't know each other, but I become the person like kind of links everybody together. And I'm a trusted source that I know they're going to get along. I know they're going to probably collaborate together, help each other out, but more than anything, just taking time to be present with each other, getting away from the event, getting away from everything and just being in a group of friends was awesome. So this conversation, you can follow my guest, IG Romy Chase forever on Twitter, Romy underscore Chase. It's so nice when I get to sit with a familiar face, somebody that I've already had an amazing conversation with. And in this short period of time, since we first met, now is already taking on a new adventure. That's my friend, Romy Chase, who now has entered into the world of music. And this is so excited. And I can't wait to talk to you about it, Romy. How are you? I'm great. I was very excited for this show. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> And Lainey recently told me that she got to see you perform. So let's kind of start from the jump. How long have you been pursuing music? Oh, my gosh. So I've basically been singing since, since I was practically a toddler. Um, I was about five years old when I have my, had my first performance. 
Um, it wasn't nothing, you know, serious, nothing special, but it was just like a little school play thing. And shortly after that, my father, you know, he noticed that I, I had a knack for it and had a little talent going on. So he signed me up for some kind of singing classes and piano lessons privately. And shortly after that, I was already performing at a local uh, theater and uh, basketball games for my hometown team where I'm from. So <laughs> it's been a while. Unfortunately, I quit singing uh, right after my parents um, passed away when I was 15 years old. Um, you know, nobody was willing to invest in that anymore. So I had to unfortunately quit, but I'm back now. So <laughs> that's all that matters. So you're now taking this under your wing and it's kind of a little tribute to your parents as well, I'm sure, right? Doing it reminds you of all of those little journeys you went on and trips. So what type of music are you singing? Where can everyone hear your music? <laughs> I am a R&B soul pop singer. Um, I make music with, uh, with a message, with meaning. It, it means a lot to me. I've always been that way, whether I create content or music, whatever it is, I try to um, have a message in it. I, I like creating stuff that, that has a meaning. Um, you can find me on Spotify and YouTube. Uh, my new single, Control, is on all, pl all platforms. So wherever it, you get your music, that works. But as far as YouTube and Spotify, which are my main platforms, just simply search Romy Chase and you'll find me there. Add me to your playlist <laughs> and subscribe. Yes. Are you writing your music yourself? I actually am. Um, it's very, it, it's an interesting project. That's for sure. I have never, ever thought I could be a writer of any kind, but it, you know, I, I set this little personal challenge for myself, mostly because, you know, I also want to uh, own the rights to my songs, you know, and when you start, you know, putting all these different people in it, they all get a percentage. But I, I, I like challenges and I'm a linguist um, by occupation. I have a master's degree in linguistics. So I thought, why not, you know, put that to use? And I, you know, I, me being myself, I love researching. I love learning new things. So I definitely looked up a lot of, you know, a lot of tutorials on how to write lyrics, a lot of, I read a lot of books, countless books on how to make music, how to promote music, how to even write music, you know? And that's how I wrote my first single. It, it was definitely a journey, but I think I, I, it came out pretty good. <laughs> Well, Romy, how much of this understanding of ownership of content do you think comes from you owning your content with everything else that you're doing? Because you're not just starting from scratch. You're in production already. You're moving this into a different world. I'm sure it's a different hustle to say, right? But how much do you think has trained your mind to be like, oh, I can do from start to finish on this and own all of it? Honestly, I've always been a huge advocate for owning your content, um, whether it's music or is it, you know, adult content or any other content, uh, because you can, a lot of people don't know this and they don't understand, but you can do this yourself. It is challenging and it takes a little uh, longer and you're probably not going to blow up right away, you know, but small steps, as long as you're progressing, as long as you're growing every day, you can do this. And to me, that is extremely important. I've always wanted to be in charge of what I'm doing. And that's the same way I, you know, I, I, I've been in the adult industry as well. I have never shot for a mainstream company <laughs> and everything I've built, I've built myself. And I just, I take, I, I take huge pride in that. I think it's really important to, to yeah, own I mean, your stuff. You have to not be in a hurry. You have to have patience, right, when you're doing it yourself, but you're also not relying on other people. And I don't know about you, but I've found, I know I can rely on myself. I know I'm going to get my shit done. Every time someone else comes into the mix, you know, one out of every two or three people is either hard to reach, not reliable, doesn't come through, promises you a ton. And so you end up wasting just as much time chasing people as you would if you just sat down and said, I'm going to do this all on my own. Exactly. At the end of the day, you can only rely on yourself. 
really. It's that simple. And I follow this rule in my everyday life as well. <laughs> so how much time are you putting into music? Because you're still creating content for your page. You're still doing everything else. How much time are you putting aside? Are you scheduling it? How are you managing this new career mixed in with your, your career? It's really interesting. I get this question question a lot. People always ask, me, "How do you how do you manage to do all this by yourself? Like create content and manage social media, and then you know, like my OnlyFans, it's all me as well. I don't even have an agent for that. So, you know, it's it. People always find it um, shocking that it's all you know me and my small team. But I am a huge fan of scheduling and planning. And once you get that schedule and once you plan it all out, you will see how much free time you really have because we're really not aware of this. Like we're always, you know, on social media scrolling, probably spent like two hours a day watching TikTok or whatever. Eliminate that and make an actual schedule. You know, even if you're your own boss, I still function on a strict schedule. You know, I clock into my my home office at eight in the morning, you know, and I'm here until five, six p.m., and then after that, I'm working my my socials and my fan pages. And I, I found this to be extremely, extremely beneficial to do it this way. I As far as music, how much time I spend on it, I have um, a so-called a creative time, <laughs> which is, you know, I, I sit in my office, I, I light up some candles, you know, I'll probably take an edible maybe even. <laughs> And, you know, pull out my notebook, write down whatever I'm feeling. And that's how I create my songs. Probably do it about three or four times a week, you know, because it really it's interesting. It really doesn't take that much time to um, write a song. It's really right. like just a one day thing. You right. Know? You're in, in, the, in the right mood, mood, you know. So and, you know, you talked about your hours. Like, do you know what your peak hours are? Like when you're the most productive? I find I used to be a night owl. I thought I was a night owl. I convinced myself I was, but it turns out that I'm absolutely not. <laughs> and when I moved to Las Vegas, which was in March uh, this year, I decided to just completely change everything that I was doing. You know, new house, new me kind of thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. New environment. You know, my, my mortgage went up a little bit, so now I have to work a little different, a little harder. Then I got deleted on Instagram and, you know, everything plummeted. So I had to completely reconstruct everything that I was doing. And I switched to a morning schedule and that's been working out wonderful. I try to get everything done before 4 p.m. if I can. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a 9, to, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. is like I can get done my whole day of, I'll take meetings and stuff after that. But like all my tedious things I find, I just, I do my list before I go to bed. I kind of keep it scheduled of what I'd like to accomplish within which hours. And I just bang through it. Like that's when I'm the most, then I take like a lunch break and then you kind of slow down. So what I've learned with my scheduling is like what things I'm going to put later in the day. Like it's great for me to have conversations for my podcast later in the day. Um, it's great for me to be able to be at my desk handling everything that's going out to my people early in the morning. But we, it, it does transition, I think, as we get older. But when you know your peak hours, it's so important for your schedule. Yeah, I think honestly, nine. So 8 a.m. to like 10 a.m. is my best time. That's when I'm like the freshest, you know, I, I don't know. I just get the most done during those hours. But and you're less likely to like lean into something like scrolling. You are in the morning. You just don't do that stuff. You're like, oh no, I'm here to do this, this, and this. Exactly. Exactly. And that is so true. You know, as soon as it gets, starts getting dark outside, I kind of clock out like yeah. naturally just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at some documentaries, you know, but evenings are pretty good for me for um, reading and research. Um, I, I do those things in the evenings. Somehow it works. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it all comes down to knowing your schedule. Like when yeah. are you the most? Prepared? Knowing when you peak, knowing when you peak. So you don't dawdle around with projects. You just hammer them out. So when we last spoke, you were living in Miami, which is where you live for a long time. I have to ask you. How are you adjusting to Vegas? It's a different place to live, different climate, different everything. How are you adjusting? Time zone? 
right now I'm struggling with the cold. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> it was like it's all cold at night. I mean, during the day too, like, you know, you get up and you leave the house around seven in the morning, seven thirty. it's like 35 degrees outside. It's cold. <laughs> I, you know, I am originally from Poland, which is a, a frozen tundra, I like to call it. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, when I moved to Florida, I definitely adjusted to the heat, uh, fast and I loved it. Now the summers in Vegas are brutal. Okay. This was my first summer. It was it was hot, Lisa. <laughs> it was hot. It was like 120 degrees. But I, I I would say I adjust pretty easily. So I'm I'm good. The honestly, the biggest thing that I struggled with at first, and it was the worst, was dry skin. Honestly, yeah. that was I couldn't handle it for a few weeks. You know, coming from Miami with high humidity, you know, your skin is always nice and moisturized and soft. And you come here, you're ashy, like lotion, bottles of lotion. And it, that still wouldn't cut it. So it was. Yeah, you, you kind of have to change your skincare because exactly. you're not need, you need something that's more balmy and richer in a drier place. You know, same with a friend of mine. They're now living outside of Lake Tahoe and like the elevation and the dry, even her, she's like, even my hair is drier than it was. So like, yeah, there's all those things that it takes to adjust to. And Vegas heat in the summer, it's like two really bad months where like during the day, if you go out to your car and it's not parked under something, your steering wheel is so hot. Like everything is so hot, right? But honestly, it's still better um, as far as the heat uh, because it's dry heat and then you don't sweat so much. Yep. In Miami, summer, we literally couldn't shoot outside. No. Wake up, everything's, you know, melting. Your, hair. your hair's frizzing out to here. All these things are happening. Yeah, and, but I mean, you know, what inspired you to move? Was it the ability that you could shoot more content because there's more performers in Vegas or the size of a place where you can live? What inspired you to move? So actually, the crazy thing was that um, I was um, still renting in Miami. Um, I was looking for a house to purchase in Miami. But I got into an issue with my landlord, actually, because he found my OnlyFans and um, Googled me and looked up a bunch of information. And it told him that, you know, I made such and such amount of money <laughs> and he wasn't having it. He literally came to my house for an inspection where he really didn't inspect anything. Um, he came to tell me that he found my OnlyFans, my Instagram. He went through all that stuff and he is raising my rent. Um, he tried to raise it 120%, actually. He raised it, tried to raise it from $2,300 to $4,800 um, a month. Is that and legal in Florida? Unfortunately, I obviously, you know, me being myself, I spoke to a lawyer, uh, a couple right. of them actually. And apparently in Florida, there is no cap on rent. So. Wow. He could do that legally. And, you know, I had a choice. I had to, you know, make a choice whether I'm going to stay and actually pay that 4800 or move and, you know, fight somewhere else. So I started looking for houses in Miami, like more serious. And I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted. I'm a big house kind of person. <laughs> I need a lot of space. I don't know why. Some people can, you know, live in apartments. I can't do that. I told myself I want a five bedroom, five bathroom. I want a pool. Okay. So those are my three requirements. Now in Florida <laughs> with the inflation and, you know, Miami being a hot and everybody moving there. Yeah. Yeah. That was about $2 million. Um, and I just told myself, I, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. So I literally looked up other places <laughs> in America and I was like, hmm, Vegas looks nice, you know? And then I found yeah. a house in Vegas. I actually sent my assistant to travel to Vegas. While I was doing a media tour in New York, I sent him to Vegas to check out the house for me. And he, you know, sent me all the pictures and all that stuff. And I was like, I'll take it. I literally went, while I was in the, on tour in New York, I went to the bank <laughs> and I made my, you know, down payment. Um, so that's how it happened. And the reason why I was even able to do this in, in such a crazy way is because, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed just like yourself. So it doesn't matter like where I live. I can live in Montana if I want right. to. 
Yep. You know, yep. and, and my earnings are not affected by that because most of it comes from online sales. So right. that's literally what happened. I know it's crazy, but it worked out. <laughs> because I saw the article in the New York Post about your landlord. And, you know, here's the thing. Like, first of all, it's awful that Florida doesn't have restrictions on what someone can do because it's not fair that someone can look you up that way. But in reality, there was no way you were going to pay that much money to live in the same place that no. you were living in for the other money. Like, you just can't do that. At just no. principle, you no. couldn't do that. And also, you cannot trust this person to yes. not come after you for more things. Like, you've already come at me sideways. I don't trust you. And this is my living space. Now you own. Nobody can come down on you for anything. And you're in a great area to network for content because there's so many creators that live in Vegas. Um, it's an easier place to be able to have larger spaces. And the neighborhoods, the communities off of the strip, people only picture the strip, but the communities are so beautiful. There's so many nice, safe, like all brand new kind of shopping centers and everything. You probably really enjoy how much more space there is than what you had in Miami. I literally was thinking about this the other day. Uh, my mortgage is actually lower than that rent that he asked. <laughs> and the house is like a thousand square feet bigger than the other house. You know, so, I mean, it's a no-brainer, really. <laughs> Plus, I, I'm a suburban kind of person, and I really enjoy the quiet and peace of, of Vegas. It's it's still a hot destination, and a lot of people are moving here, but it's still nowhere near as crowded as Miami is. Oh, no way. No way. So, the traffic isn't as bad. And what yeah. else is great living, you know, suburbia Vegas is when you do want to go out to eat. You have every restaurant option <laughs> in Vegas. You know, <laughs> the day spas, the everything, the shows. There's always so much to do. So where do you see yourself starting to get your music out other than on Spotify and streaming? Are you planning on doing live shows? Are you planning on do? Where can we see you? I definitely plan on doing that. I am still working because um, I only have um, so far or one original track. And um, honestly, you know, you can plan a, plan for it to do well, but I wasn't expecting to get a, a few hundred thousand views on my first song. Um, that was actually a surprise for me. Obviously, I wanted that, <laughs> but I wasn't necessarily ready. So as far as shows, that's a little bit on pause right now because I don't I simply don't have um, what's the word a repertoire yet. Yes, for that. yes. But it's coming very soon, and definitely when I start booking shows, I'll be letting everybody on my social media know where to, you know, come see me. But right now, we are strictly focusing on creating music. I'm right. sitting currently on three new songs. We'll be releasing them right after the holidays, because this is the end of the year, and the very beginning is not really a good time to release new music, unless you are a super established person like Drake. Of course. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not worth it. Everybody's distracted with all of the things they have going on, their holiday plans, their stuff, you know. It's and also we've got AVN coming up. So am I going to get to see you there? Um, I might pop up for, you know, a, a minute or two. You live I, right there. Yeah, I wasn't planning on attending the whole thing. Um, but some of my coaching girls are going to be there, so I might just, you know, come and say hi cuz some of them have a shoot schedule with my photographer anyway. So, so you are still coaching. You brought this business with you as well. <laughs> I am still coaching. Um, right now I'm scaling it down a little bit because it's a lot. Um, my coaching is very personalized. I don't do mass coaching where I just like create a PDF and send it to you so you can learn from it. I generally do one-on-one -on -one calls and like a, I have a support group for my girls and it's very demanding. Um, so I don't have all the time in the world to just keep taking new people. But the people that I do have are doing so well. I am so proud of them. Like I can't even, words can't express like how much, how happy it makes me. Because I've always been, you know, very passionate about empowering women and teaching women how to be independent and um, how to, you know, because they're already sexual. They already want to use their sex appeal to make money. And you might as well, you know, start them in the right direction. And it's I love that you do that. And, you know, when you say it's very personal, of course it is, because the only way you can truly make somebody successful is to get to know them 
Okay. What are their, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Where can they compromise? And you got to put those together. It is not a one size fits all situation. And some people are more tech savvy. Some people are, you know, better writing captions. Some people are better at interacting. Some people are better. So I'm sure the first time when you first take on a new client, it's you getting to know them, what their habits are, what their work ethic is, how long they think a work day is. And I was talking to somebody about this the other day, you know, people who work five days a week and live for the weekend, when you do what we do in a 24 hour, seven day a week sphere of the globe, the web, you know, there really isn't two days off in a row. You might get to lay back a little bit, but you're still going to be on your phone doing stuff, whether it's editing photos, whatever it is, there's always a computer in your lap and a phone, but we love it because it provides us with the freedom to live the lives we want to live right now and know that our futures are going to be taken care of. Exactly. I haven't, I haven't taken a full day, taken a full day off ever since I started this whole career. I have not taken a day off and I really don't even feel like I need it. (laughs) When you do take a little bit of time, like, do you like to go to the spa? Do you like to get massages? How do you unwind? I, I I really like traveling. Um, so whenever I get a chance, I like to get in my car, you know, grab a friend or even just go by myself, just drive somewhere, you know, I'm in Grand Canyon right here, you know, four hours, yes. things yes. like that, go to Zion. LA, quick, you know, um, and I've, I'm trying to get into more of this, like off the beaten path traveling, uh, next upcoming year. Cause I've always been a fan of that. I never, I don't know. I just, I've always been this kind of person, like everybody going right. I, I'm trying to go left and see what's over there. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I don't, <laughs> so I've always wanted to travel to like less desired destinations. Like people think of, Oh, we go to America. Where do you go? Like New York and LA. I'm trying to go to like New Mexico. You know what I mean? See what's over there and interact with people over there, get to know some customs and traditions. You know over- what? You got to go to Alaska. I, I want to. I really do. You have I to. Do. I did 10 days there in 2019. I got to tell you, I did the whole state. Started at one end and took the train across. I love to take trains train because you start. see untouched nature. There were all, you know, all the moose, the elks just walking through the snow, like kind of swimming in the snow. And you just, you see un, not developed. No one lives there. Like you just see this beauty and it's a great way to not just be like, okay, we went to the airport and then we were in this area around there. Um, and from Anchorage, we took these excursions like 45 minutes away this way, 45 minutes away this way to get a little bit deeper and like dog sledding and all of these different things. Like Alaska is a beautiful state and people are just so, content there, right? They're just, it's a very different, each state in the United States has its own thing, but there's a couple of states that are very unique. And I would definitely say Alaska is one of them. I I really want to, I definitely will eventually. I just, you know, try to figure out when, and right now, you know, I took on this new project of making music. So now I have to focus on this and I don't really have all this time and, you know, spare cash just laying there to just go and travel. Cause Let's be honest, <laughs> making music isn't cheap, especially when you're starting out and you're independent. Um, everything is paid for out of pocket. And now we're messing with the mainstream world. So we're messing with mainstream prices. And unfortunately, you know, each song costs about, you know, anywhere from five to $10,000. Wow. Yeah, it's, you know, it, that's if you're incorporating a music video on a base, base level music video. Yeah, well, base level. music video, that's like 25000 right there, you know? Yeah, or, or more, or more, or you know? Right, obviously. If you're so, Eminem, you're putting hundred thousand dollars into that video. Or a million. I mean, there's videos that's been made that were like over a million dollars to make, yeah. you know? And unfortunately, I'm not at that level yet where I can just, oh, here's a million, you know, let me whip it out. But um, I, you know, I'm, I definitely believe in this. And I think, I honestly feel the same way about, about everything. Every project that I take on, I'm going to treat this serious. And it really comes down to this. If you are consistent and if you keep on going and learning and growing every day, you're going to succeed at whatever it is that you want to do. I so. could not agree with that. I say it to everyone all the time. People ask me, how did you stay in the industry for so long? How did you do this? Consistency. 
Like you got to be consistent yeah. with your look, with how you take care of yourself, with how you communicate with people. Don't respond to someone's email a day later and then the next time a week later. Like have a routine where it's like everyone knows you're going to get back to them within 24 hours and it's always the same. You know, respond to your messages. Don't let things wait. Like those are consistent things. But you're a grinder. You love to work hard. You find I'm sure that when you lay your head on your pillow at night, every day you feel like you accomplish something and that's a rewarding feeling to you. I try to learn something new every day. That's for sure. And I am um, a huge believer in the, you know, the fact that you can learn something from everyone, no matter who they are. You know, it could be a janitor or a, a queen of England. I don't care. You can learn something from everyone. And so I just try to do that. I try to absorb that knowledge and then sit down at the end of the day, analyze what I, you know, what I learned, what I did, mistakes, you know, all that. So it really, it really all comes down to that. But it's funny that you mentioned consistency because <laughs> ah, I'm having a hard time, you know, converting people from, um, you, you know, what I'm currently doing, which is content and adult entertainment to music because people love to put you in a box. And mm -hmm. once you're in the box, it's so hard to crawl out of it. It's so incredibly hard to get these people to, to click on something new, you know? And, and even if they do click on it, you know, once you're in the box, like there's so many things about the box. I wrote, I wrote this whole blog post one day about the box years ago. I'll have to find it and send it to you because I was oh, so yeah, affected. I would love to read it. And I said, when your box finally does open and the flaps of the box start to open, they create shade outside of your box on other things. So the people who maybe try to believe in you, then they lose out on opportunities because they're dealing with you. Like our opening of the box, the shade that it creates, then people putting you back in. And then also just the amount of people that will follow what you're doing and then say horrible things. Like I'm still, the other night I went to a Knicks game. This is off topic, but I went to the Knicks game with a friend. We had floor seats. It was amazing. I spent 48 minutes that night deleting comments from Instagram. Oh. Like just how disturbed people are. Who am I fucking? What what player am I fucking? Who the, who how how much how much money did did that guy pay for me to hang out with him? Like just like I'm just like, "Oh my gosh." Like and I just want to delete it because it just burdens me that it's there. And also when I'm deleting, I'm able to see nice people and respond to them. But like, I didn't think it would take me that long. And when I finally looked at the other, by other phone, I'm like, you've been doing this for 48 minutes. That is a problem. People are showing you how lonely they are. And I find Fridays, people are the meanest on social media. And I find before the holidays, people who are lonely and who are looking for attention, they lash out more. But so being in the box is really difficult because no one can relate to being inside and looking out. 80, let's say 99% of the world can only look in the box. We're in the box, right? I just we know what it's like to look out. Yeah. I just feel like the world is such a better place if we just didn't have these boxes. Because, yeah, it's just why. Like, you you mentioned that people were horrible to you. I definitely experienced something very similar with my music, you know, people might still think that it's still all right. It's an all right song. It's, you know, but it's something new. So they immediately reject it no matter what. I don't care how good it is. Immediately. Oh, music? No. And yeah, yeah it was like, this is what a guy commented um, on my one of my Twitter posts where I was promoting the song. He was like, stick to sucking dick music. I get that every day. I get <laughs> sick to sucking dick every day. Or you look better with a dick in your mouth. Or just, and I'm just like, oh my God, like why? Why, what? first and foremost, why say anything? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Because you know what? At the end of the day. Exactly. Unless you at the end of it, actually to you. add. Right. And that's and at the end of the day, that reflects more back on them than it does us. What it does is you are putting words out. Words are magnetic, just like everything else. And just because people think it's only going on Twitter or it's only going on Instagram and nobody's going to see it, it doesn't matter. You have created a low frequency by putting that out there and that low frequency surrounds you. It doesn't surround me. It surrounds you, but it's a constant. And 
I'm always here for you as you go through this transition, because trust me, nobody went through it like I did going from this to sports where I'm still in a very male dominated world. A lot of my fans kindly came over and really enjoy this, but I still every day get people fighting with me about it because let's face it, porn is not time sensitive. So most of them don't know if you did the scene yesterday or 10 years ago. And so it follows you for your entire life. Even 20 years after you're shooting, people are still going to find you, think that's new and then see something else that you're doing and be burdened by it burdens them. It and truly burdens them. There, the people are upset um, that women take ownership of their lives in general, whether it's porn or whatever it is, they get absolutely upset that we don't rely on a man to pay our bills or whatever. And I just, you know, first of all, the worst thing about it, all these hateful comments is that I know you wrote uh, multiple books. The people who, you know, going to talk shit about your books have never written as much as a dissertation in their life. Okay. As far as music, same thing. People that are, you know, criticizing my music, the way I sing or the, the kind of producer that I, they always have something to say, fire your producer. He can be, oh, get some singing lessons. You know what? But like, this is the, that's the worst part is this. These comments are always just pure hate because if you really had some advice that could actually help me, you would just put it out there and then I can look at it and I'm not, you know, the kind of person who can't handle a little bit of criticism. I appreciate it. If you come at me properly, respectfully say, Hey, I don't think you did this right. Can you maybe look into that again? And, and here's some alternatives. I can look at it, but you have no advice. You just want to hate. So no, nobody's going to take that serious, you know, but I always do say that you got to have some, you know, you got to have thick skin. Uh, especially in the adult industry. It is. You got to have super thick. And so do your people. So do your friends because they're going to get it too. It's keeping us in a box and it is. The box is a struggle. And look, you're better off going to prison and getting out and re-entering into the world than you are leaving porn and re-entering into the world. People are more likely to want to help somebody that did something horrific than us. And that's their own guilt that's tied to them, how much they lust for us or how much they like watching porn. But if your first words out of your mouth, when you see a girl post a photo from a basketball game are about porn, that's on you. Okay. That is so on you and not on me, but it's something that we're always going to have to deal with. And the more we all stay together and kind of share each other's stories, the easier it is. We're colleagues, you know, we're going to go through these woes and there's times where you just want to lean on somebody. So you know that you can always lean on me. I cannot wait to listen to your single and to support your music. And Romy, you are an inspiring, intelligent, motivated, disciplined woman. You're going to do whatever you want, whenever you want. And no one's ever going to stop that. Yes, that that is me. I I'm here to live my life the way I want and the way that makes me happy. And if I can help people along the way, that's even better because I am super passionate about that, especially when it comes to women in the adult industry. I've seen so many people just get screwed over, mm -hmm. you know, underpaid, undervalued. They take these horrible contracts, you know, these yeah. companies are exploiting and it takes, it, it just all kind of comes down to like lack of conf confidence, I would yeah. say. And yeah. I'm here and to awareness, right? That. Also a lack of awareness, not having somebody to go to, not going to somebody that maybe went through something similar. Just it's, it takes time. Exactly. And I'm, you know, my, my coaching, my social media, just generally who I am as a person I encourage self-growth and research and just make sure you do this right. Whatever it is that you're doing, you want to be a writer? Cool. But make sure you look up how to do this. Don't just do stuff on a whim because that never works. And then you self-sabotage yourself because you wrote a shitty book, obviously, because you didn't learn how to, the structure of the book, how to write it, what to, you know, how to keep people interested throughout. 
The information is out there now. It's so much easier now than when I was a kid. You could just Google shit. People ask me stuff online all the time, like on Twitter. They're asking me questions like, you know, it'd be just as easy for you to Google that as it is for you to ask me to help you do something that is for you. And if you're asking a second party and you're not going to research it yourself and learn about it yourself, guess what? You don't want it that bad. Because when you want it that bad, you do the fucking work. Exactly. And believe it or not, I have women who sign up for my coaching, which isn't the cheapest uh, investment. You know, it's at least a couple thousand. And those are women who are struggling financially. So, you know, the fact that they can, you know, come up with the two, three thousand dollars to pay, you know, you would think they would take that seriously. But you, I can't even tell you how many times I literally have women who pay and then they don't like something that I do in the coach and they just ghost and bounce and like just drop it off. You know, they self, they, people self-sabotage themselves so much. And I myself have been guilty of that in the past, too. That's why I know. <laughs> and that's why I can teach people how to not do that, you know. We've all learned our greatest life lessons from the mistakes that we've made and the mistakes that we don't want to repeat. So that's how we learn and that's how we grow. Thank you so much again. I I love that I got to see you again, Romy. I hope I get to see you for a little bit in Vegas. Maybe we can meet up for a coffee or something if you're stopping by. But it's a pleasure and to continued success to you and now your music, which everyone can find on Spotify and listening platforms. Just search Romy Chase. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it was a lot of fun. Here's a little message for all of you who would like to save some money on your Viagra and Cialis. You can go to ultrafarmrx.com forward slash Lisa. In two minutes or less, you can fill out your survey. You'll talk to a licensed physician and your package will arrive discreet and be delivered. Ever feel like your performance just doesn't measure up? Does worrying about it make it worse? Let me let you in on a little secret. Many men use Viagra and Cialis not just to treat ED, but to boost their performance and last longer. Whether you're in front of the camera or behind closed doors, every man can use a little help to last longer. It's never been simpler to get what you need. At ultrafarmrx.com, you can get doctor-trusted treatments 100% confidential online from your phone. No awkward doctor visits. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Discreet and confidential, guaranteed. Better performance is just a few clicks away at ultrafarmrx.com. Such a cool conversation with Romy Chase, hearing that she's getting back to her roots, that she, you know, had music in her life when she was younger. The loss of her parents at such a young age must have really been something because you can see how tenacious she is, how hard she works, how dedicated she is to always growing, always learning. She's always reading. She's one of the friends I know I could be in a book club with and she would outread me nonstop. But make sure you give her a follow and check out her music. You can search it on all platforms under Romy Chase. It is the moment you have all been waiting for the mailbag. If you want to be a part of the mailbag, you could email me at asklisaann at gmail.com. Here we go. And we've got good emails again, again, with the good emails. I appreciate you all so much. I love reading these emails. It's not quite as frightful as it once was. So thank you. This one says, hi, Lisa, you've answered several of my email questions in the past, so I'm going to ask another one. You've mentioned that you enjoy spending time with your friends over a nice dinner, participating in charity events, and preparing and doing your podcast. My question to you is, what brings you the most satisfaction in all that you do in your life? Thanks again for all you do and keep on living your life the way you want to live it. It's a great last, it's a great last statement in an email. What brings me the most satisfaction in my life? 
I think it is the moments. I know it is. It's the moments where I can just be myself in the company of my closest friends. I'll use Thanksgiving in Lake Tahoe for an example. You know, there's moments where I like completely forget about the internet. I forget about social media. I forget about everything other than us just talking, playing with the dogs, me cooking, us watching football or watching movies, you know, just being present in the company of the people that make me feel the most comfortable in my skin. I love to travel with Kay. Kay and I will be on our adventures. Then we'll have a great dinner. We'll just chop it up about whatever. It's just being in the presence of love, kindness, support. And uh, that's where I really find myself refueling the tank to do everything else that I'm doing. So I find my most satisfaction with my trusted small group of people that truly know everything about me inside and out and make me feel just the most comfortable in my skin. Thanks for that great question. I appreciate you. All right. Question number two. This is a fun one. I'm coming up with a funny question. Let us walk down memory lane today. Do you remember when you learned to eat with chopsticks. And how did it go? My own story about chopsticks. My mom was interested in international cuisine, Asian as well. We learned at a very young age that our father let us know that we must be able to use the chopsticks by the age of six at latest. Honestly, I had no idea why he set a deadline for that, but looking back, I'm glad it was an early childhood experience. I hope today's question brought back a nice memory for you. I'm wishing you a wonderful day, your friend, Petra. This is a great one because I wasn't exposed to chopsticks until I was in my early 20s and I moved to California. I wasn't exposed to a lot of stuff. I had never had sushi. I had never had an avocado. There were tons of fruits, like so many things I didn't have, but let's go to sushi. My neighbors, who I'm still friends with, and one of the neighbors that lived near me, not my best, best, best friends that I go to Lake Tahoe with every, because all, so, you know, all of my closest friends were like my first neighbors in California, and they've been my friends ever since. And then I met other neighbors that I'm really close with. But my girlfriend, who is now retired, and in August, her and her husband embarked on living on a boat for their retirement. And just last week, we did our FaceTime. We do one like once a month. And there she was. And I'm just watching the water behind. I'm like, this is so trippy. How are we talking? Oh, we've got Elon Musk Starlink on the boat. We get good, we get good internet. I was like, this is amazing. And she was showing me behind like the, the mountain that she had hiked that day. And I could just see the boat kind of going. It was so cool. But it was her and another neighbor, Dave. And they took me for sushi and I looked at the chopsticks and I was like, oh, to me, it looked like finger food. Like you just be like, no, you don't just pick it up. And there's no fork really option. Right. So they got a rubber band. That's how I initially learned. They took a rubber band and put them around the end of the back of the chopsticks because the rubber band kind of holds them together. When you, Because when you first start to hold them, one of them always falls out of your hand, right? So you're just like, what do I do with these? What do I do with these? And then once the rubber band was there, it was like a hinge, right? So it made it easier for me to open and close and pick up. It took a minute. I'm I'm not going to lie. It was a funny experience, but I was in my early twenties. I had never had any other experience. We didn't eat a lot of Chinese food growing up. And if we did, we ate it with a fork. Um, but we didn't have a Chinese food restaurant that we went to in my whole town regularly. So like Chinese food was like if we went into the city or maybe one or two of my friends, their parents would make it once in a while, but maybe I had it 10 times my whole childhood till I moved to California. And I'd never even seen sushi except on TV. So I was pretty sheltered, as you may say. And so my very first experience, I'm sitting inside a restaurant in Huntington Beach Everyone's looking at me and my friends ask the server to get a rubber band so they can rubber band the uh, chopsticks together for me and teach me how to use them. So it was an epic fail uh, for probably the first four or five times where I would drop the food, Um, but they would not let me use a fork. They would not let me use my fingers. And then I learned and now it's like second nature, but it was an old, you know, most people had known way before. I mean, Peter, you had to use blood by six. I didn't learn until I was in my 20s. So it did take a little bit longer. And I remember us laughing a lot at me trying to figure out, like, it seems so complex. And now it's like, oh, you don't even think about it. So this email, this is our last email in the mailbag, but it's a long email. 
And a lot of times when I get a long email, I'm like, oh, I'm never going to be able to get through this. This is going to be too much to read. I, I don't want to. But there's so much thought put into this email and it's such an important conversation that I'm going to share the email and something I thought a lot about. I actually took it with me to the gym this morning on my phone so I could really read it multiple times and really think about the best way I could advise. Dear Lisa Ann, I write this to you just after recently listening to my first podcast of yours, the one regarding your departure from the gravy train. If you're able to pursue this, I want to pursue through this. I want to thank you in advance for taking the time out of your schedule and give this email a look. This email is centered around relationship advice, and I figured it couldn't hurt to ask the queen herself as I found your take on response your take on relationships to be very intriguing. I don't know the tone of which these emails are supposed to be written, so I will keep it as PG as possible. So what I love here is we've got a new listener who automatically came in with a very good email. Currently, I'm 25, about to be 26-year-old male. I've been in a relationship with my partner for five and a half years. Our relationship is pretty solid. We don't argue much. We enjoy each other's company, but we are on two opposite ends of the spectrum with a few things. One of those is being physical, is our physical intimacy. She doesn't place the same value on it that I do. I feel as though it's crucial for the continuation of a relationship where she feels as though it is a bonus perk. I am lucky if we are able to do anything in the bedroom, maybe once every other week. When we do something, it's the same, constantly. She shows no desire to participate. The term dead fish could be used to explain, to describe the amount of effort she puts in. I am the one to start anything, and I never feel confident in what I'm doing because of lack of feedback. It leaves me feeling less than sought after. I understand that she has put little weight on that since we first met. Therefore, she... Let me read this. I understand that she has put on a little weight since we first met. Therefore, she struggles with self-confidence. But I make sure to let her know that I think she is as attractive as ever. I'm not sure what to do. Initially, I thought it was something that was wrong with me. I changed my style, my smell. I got in really good shape. I stay clean and well-groomed. I've even performed countless hours of research to aid in her pleasure. I occasionally bring home flowers, constantly perform my chores around the house, and try to give her the back rubs and massages that she likes, just not as frequently as I probably should. I'm not proud of it, but I did take me quite some time to figure out her launch code. Once I did, I thought, this is it. Now she'll want me more. I was wrong. Our intimacy has flatlined. It leaves me feeling guilty for lusting after something more. I know I'm not perfect. I am sure I overlooked some of my own flaws, but I do believe in constant improvement and growth in a relationship. I have been faithful this whole time, but it hasn't been easy. I'm not inundated with women on a daily basis, but I'm also not an unattractive guy. So I do believe in, a, in if the relationship were to end, I could seek elsewhere with little issue. What should I do? This lack of sex drive on her end To be expected, is is her lack of sex drive on her end to be expected in most relationships? I've only been with two people since I've started dating, her and another. I don't remember the last one being so dire, but it was quite some time ago. I am at the point where the lack of intimacy is driving a rift between us. I feel as though I'm still relatively young and should be able to enjoy what I have, whereas she feels as though what we have is plenty. Overall, she's a great woman, but I do not see improvement in this category in the future. Our intimacy used to be great, very adventurous and thrilling. Now vanilla isn't isn't even a powerful enough word to describe it. I don't want to come off as I'm trash talking her because I do love her and she is a great person. Oh, our, sorry. However, though, sometimes reading a long email, however, though, I feel as though intimacy is important to a relationship and it will only decline with age. Therefore, if it's this bad already, it can't get much better. 
I foresee it becoming a much bigger problem being that I am unable to open up about my desires anymore. Am I just sidestepping the inevitable? You may not cover this. I'm not sure. As I mentioned, I've only listened to one podcast so far. Perhaps there's a particular podcast that you've created that I should listen to. Perhaps you don't have time and I respect that as well. If you do find yourself able to offer any advice, it would be greatly appreciated. And I apologize for the lengthy email. There's a lot to unpack here, but a beautifully written email from somebody who is really reaching out to improve a category of the relationship. You can see the effort here and you can see the thought put into what can I do to resolve this missing link, right? How can I make this link stronger? What could I be doing better? I give you, the author of this email, so much credit for your patience, for your kindness, for your ability to properly use your words and explain your situation. I'm never going to be one that says the grass is always greener on the other side of the street, but I am going to suggest a couple of things. First of all, you're very young to be in a relationship for this long that is not at a peak of excitement. And, and as a, as a male at that age, you're, you, you are, your hormones are peaking a bit and you want that kind of collect connection. A lot of people will tell you that intimacy is the glue that holds the relationship together. I want to know if potentially suggesting you see us, you see a therapist together. Couples therapy can be very helpful. Could you find out potentially maybe something happened in her young life that has affected her value on sex and her want to have sex? I would never tell somebody to break up with somebody and end a relationship that has been smooth in so many other categories. But at the same time, when we accept things that don't bring us joy, we end up living a very mediocre life. And nobody wants a mediocre life. Yes, you're not believing that you're going to have sex like a porn star with the next person, but what you really want to do, what I sense from this email, and I'm sure my listeners are going to agree, what I sense is this is the person you want to be with. You just want to fix this one area. You want to recreate this passion. You want to feel seen. You want to feel desired. You want to feel attractive to your partner. You want your partner to know they're attractive to you. You're bringing home flowers on occasion. You're doing chores. You are doing all of the right things. And if this is something that in the beginning of the relationship, it was one way and now it's a totally different way, that's a big plot twist, right? Because you kind of bought on. It's like getting a car that has AC and then a year in the AC doesn't work. You know, you want to get the AC fixed, right? I know that's really simplifying your situation, but it's a way to explain what you're trying to do here. My first approach is going to be to really sit down and have a serious conversation with your partner. There's a book called How to Have Difficult Conversations. I felt it was an incredibly helpful book. This is a difficult conversation because this can create a lot of awkwardness, but it's a conversation that if you are willing to have it with me after listening to one episode of my podcast, then you have to be willing to have it with her. There needs to be no ultimatum. There needs to be no, oh, this is the worst thing in the world, but sitting down and saying, I have something that's very important to me that I would like to share with you. And there's something that's missing from my life that would make me feel more complete if I had it. And I'm leaning on you to help me with this. Suggesting counseling is probably a great idea. Finding out where the missing link is. Here you are. You went, made sure you smelled better. You got in great shape. You're doing all this research. You know, it's easy for us to get comfortable in relationships, even in friendships. We can take people for granted. In a relationship, this is making you felt taken for granted. And it's really hard because everything else seems to be great in the situation that you're in, making it even harder to think about walking away. But at your age, you are 25, about to be 26. One of the books that I read before I got divorced 
was called Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. It was the book that gave me my final, yes, I'm getting divorced. Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. And it was a, it was a series of short stories from couples and where their breaking point was and whether they were able to mend it and move on or whether it was like, this is when I leave. And for me, it clarified, this is when I leave. For you, you have to be willing to prioritize yourself. And sometimes you're just comfortable in a relationship, but it doesn't suit you. Again, I am not suggesting you break up, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to give this to the author. I'm not giving names because it's a very personal email. But for the author of this email, you are a gift to anyone who has the opportunity to date you and spend time with you. The thought that you put into this email and the thought that you've put into creating a nice life together with your partner is absolutely brilliant and beautiful. And you deserve to be celebrated and you deserve to feel desired you deserve to have passion in your life. So the first thing is to approach the partner that you have. Try to find a way to communicate, potentially going to counseling. And then the second thing would be maybe potentially this isn't a lifelong relationship for you and you are young and you are intelligent and you are willing and you will go out there and try again. I appreciate sending me something so personal, so well-written. By the way, there was proper punctuation. There was paragraphs. It was a beautifully written email from someone who is just in a situation where the love is there, but the lust is not. And they're both kind of a needed element in the relationship. So thank you for sharing those thoughts with me. I think uh, really taking the time to communicate with each other and then making a decision for yourself because passion and intimacy is very important when we're sharing a home and sharing a life with someone. Thank you for that email. Thank you for all of your emails. If you want to get involved with the mailbag, ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. Mailbag is every week. My guest today, Romy Chase, amazing ticket rev at ticket rev on IG at ticket rev on Instagram, ultrafarmrx.com forward slash Lisa. Go there. Two minute survey. Licensed physician is going to get back to you and you are going to get your ED meds sent to you discreetly. I've got a ton of events coming up. So let's get this part started, right? Super Bowl Sunday, Sunday, February 12th. I will be at Sapphire 60. I will be hosting for the Super Bowl. My girl, Jaden Cole, who was right here on the Lisa Ann experience with me last year. uh, She will be hosting with me. I'm excited about it. I've got all of the exotica dates for you right here. April 21st through 23rd, Chicago, July 14th through 16th, Miami, November 3rd through 5th, Edison, New Jersey, and December 1st through 3rd, Washington, D.C. Go to ExoticaExpo.com to find out everything you need to know. I will be at all four Exotica shows this year, and I could not be more excited about it. Uh, July, I will be in Australia at Sydney at Sexpo. That's July 7th through 9th. This spring, you will have some new things. You're going to have my audiobook, which I'm recording with Kay the first week in February. You will also have more news about the release of My Own Wine. Very excited about that. If you want to learn more about me, go to my store, shoplisaann.com. My first book, The Life. My second book, The Life Back. Don't forget, this will be available to you as you're listening right now, but you can also be watching along with me. And that will be Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. I thank you all so much for listening. If you are a new listener, go back and catch up on what you may have missed. Had some insightful conversations last year and look forward to sharing many more with you. Subscribe, rate, and review. And to all of you, be positive, do something positive, do a good deed, smile at people, and feel good for yourself. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much for listening to an all-new episode of The Lisa Ann Experience.